So Garrison Price for Thursday, March 21st, 2024, coming to you from the Go Goat Sports Studio, built by Arbor Lee, here at the Iconic Wall Center, downtown Vancouver. If you're looking for a staycation, heading to a game, an event downtown, call the wall, 604-331-1000. Ask for the Sakarison Price rates, some blackout dates. Apply. Matt Sakaris alongside Blake Price. Grady Sass hitting switches, conducting things in this show presentation. Of Applewood Auto Group. Applewood Nissan in Surrey has some 2023 Nissan Qashqais that you could take advantage of. Finance them at 2.99% right now for up to 36 months or jump into a 2024 Nissan Leaf and skip the pumps for good up to $13,000 cash back there. It's all good at Applewood Nissan in Surrey. Tim Horton's poll question today. We're asking you, is the NHL season too long yes or no you can vote at secure some price on twitter and youtube or roll up to win is here for tim horton's 60th anniversary plan the tim's app to win prizes daily cash jackpot of ten thousand dollars can win the all-electric volkswagen id4 a sun-soaked hilton getaway download the tim's app roll up is on until march 31st uh stems out of the discussion we were having earlier in the week with john shannon about potential schedule changes coming up in the National Hockey League, that there are some Eastern Conference clubs, team officials Mm -hmm. who are wondering, you know, why do we have to play every team, fly on out, play all these Western teams, would prefer to have some of those Eastern opponents in their barns uh, as opposed to Western opponents. And look, we've covered a whole lot of bad teams here in Vancouver over the last decade, and this time of year is the death march. It's a horrible time of year. Well, and the playoff races have not been scintillating in either conference either. There's uh, glowing embers of them, but I don't mm-hmm. know there's a lot of flame there. Well, and of course, uh, you would get playoff races regardless of the length of schedule. In some cases, you may actually get better playoff races mm-hmm. if we're talking about well, for, shorter schedules. For example, I look ahead on Saturday. The Blues and the Wild are playing mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. That's a really intriguing game because if there are, if there is a playoff race in the Western Conference, well, both those teams need to win. Mm-hmm. One of those teams is going to get one that night, mm-hmm. which may, which means the Golden Knights are extra pressured to get their win that night versus the Columbus Blue Jackets. So, if you were playing a, you know, again, nobody wants to go back to eight or ten interdivisional games. I don't think anybody's suggesting no, that. too much. Too many, yeah. But there's a happy medium, and it seems like it's been uh, one way or the other. Maybe there's a, a you know an mm-hmm. equation in between. Yeah, I sort of feel like if, if you're covering a bad team, if you're following a bad team, you're, you're happy to have a shorter season. Yeah. Whereas, and this isn't the first time we've covered a good Canucks team, and these very much feel like the dog days of the NHL season. Mm-hmm. You know, mid to late March, especially when you've got a lot of people who go on out on March break holidays. I, I almost feel like this is this is a two week period for the NHL that really just doesn't need to be. Um, if you shorten the schedule, now I understand the owners' money, the players' money. It's all about the money. Nobody does greed like the National Hockey League. But I've sixty six to seventy games somewhere in there. Get your playoffs started early before the NBA. Get your Stanley Cup presented by June first. I, uh, boy, I'm all in on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. I think what the temptation would be, and this would mean an 84 game season, is you could do six against the seven interdivisional teams. Six, you know, six meetings with every team in your division. There's 42 games right there. You do three games against the team in your conference the sorry division in your conference Mm -hmm. there's another 24 games right there you're at 66 at that point Mm -hmm. and then you host one division in the east you visit one division in the east Mm -hmm. that's 16 that gets 84 yeah now you you could just do home and away with the central cut it down then you're at 76 maybe you'd prefer that Mm -hmm. home and away with the central That distinguishes them from the other conference. And we're having this discussion part and parcel because the NHL season is a little delayed this year. Uh, You typically are accustomed to the playoffs starting second week of April, somewhere in there by April 15th. The playoffs won't start this year till the 22nd of April. It's a full week late. Yeah. 
Do you know the last possible day of a Game 7 Stanley Cup final? Mm, 24th? Yeah. June 24th. June 24th. Yeah. That's usually a draft. That's day. on the other side of the solstice. You know, like you're you're fully into actually, summer. You're technically actually summer. <laughs> in summer on June 24th. The boys of summer, the Vancouver Canucks. <laughs> well, and getting back to our uh getting back to our uh our conversation with John Shannon about the um some of these eastern teams not necessarily wanting, you know, western teams on the marquee or having to go and travel the western teams. Did you see what the Winnipeg Jets tweeted at the New York Jets? The Winnipeg Jets are going through Gotham. And as we joked with John Shannon, you know, the marquee at MSG, Winnipeg Jets, Tuesday night versus the Rangers, and nine out of 10 New Yorkers going, what is a Winnipeg? Where is Winnipeg? Winnipeg Jets tweeting, hey, at New York Jets, since we're in town, do you want to get together on Friday for dinner? Because we have the same name. It could be like the... At Giants, the um, New York Giants, and at SF Giants picnic in Totowa. I don't remember that. I don't remember that either. It doesn't appear like the New York Jets has responded. Yeah, well, you don't even exist Winnipeg. in our minds, which is Jets. not nice. Come on, New York. Come on, New York Jets. You're not even New York. Exactly. Humor little Winnipeg. Jersey and Jets. Jets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get to our top story today. Habitat versus inhabitants of Rogers Arena. They are here all month, these Vancouver Canucks. A nine-game home stand, the second longest in the history of the club. And this is the middle game of the proceedings and the final game against the Eastern Conference this year with the Montreal Canadiens in town. After this, it is all Western Conference opponents the rest of the way. But, of course, they have four more home games after this one, starting Saturday against Calgary, then L.A., Dallas, and Anaheim taking you through right to the end of the month on March 31st. Now, Trip to the ha uh, trip to Rogers Arena for the Montreal Canadiens. Very special. Still a lot of Habs fans out here. Tend to buy up some tickets. I think it's going to be tougher for them this year because, needless to say, the Canucks are a tough ticket again, and that's nice to see for the first time in a number. They'll still of years. find their way in, but oh, yeah. they absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I love J Pat reminding us on Twitter this morning of the insanity that was last year's game. A four nothing Montreal lead. Vancouver comes all the way back, leads 5-4 midway through the third. Habs come back to lead 6-5 late. Canucks score late to force overtime. And Elias Pettersson scores for a 7-6 overtime victory. I don't care what you pay on the secondary market. If you get that game, that's entertainment. Yeah, I, I have vague recollections of this at the end of last year when we were at this point sort of saying again, end of the season, please, uh, ready for next year. Um, but then periodically they'd entertain us with something a little bit crazy. And that was, uh, that was one of, well, and that's where, you know, teams like the Habs are at with their fans. Like this is a 10 PM start for a Habs fan in Quebec. You better be entertained. Yeah. Like if you're not, if it's not an entertaining game, this is the time of year when a lot of fans outside of the diest of diehards check out because, oh, season's going nowhere. Uh, yeah, we'll see what draft position we're at after game 82. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes to the poll question as well. You know, it's just, it's not that fun when you're just finishing off the, the, the season. So well, at least it's not baseball though. No. Oh my God. Done in June. Oh my gosh. Covered some Blue Jays teams that were out of it in mid-May. Yeah, that's a hell of a long way to go with a lot of meaningless games. You have to really, really uh, love the team or love the sport if you were watching, you know, a hundred games of a team that's out of it. At least in hockey, you can't get all that bad. Although Sharks and Blackhawks fans um, <laughs> may dispute, given the years that they're going through. So, big news at Morning Skate. Ian Cole is getting the night off tonight. 
Now, Rick Talkett is saying he's banged up. Who isn't? You could this use time that. of year. He was at course. morning skate. He was skating. Right. He you was know, skating. He was participating. He had a conversation with Rick Tockett, if I'm not mistaken. And this is part and parcel of the load management that we wondered about for some of the older Canucks players. For some of the Canucks players that have logged a lot of minutes, a lot of miles yeah. this season. If you can find spots to give them a rest. In some cases, it may be just less ice time. In some cases, it may well just be take the night off, watch the game from the press box or the dressing room, and we'll see you, in this case, Saturday. Now, of course. So Noah Juleson draws in, and uh, that has caused a defense pair shuffle, of course. Uh, we'll see the jumbo pair there of Carson Susi and Tyler Myers with Nikita Zadorov and Noah Juleson. And, and this pair. allows Rick Tocca to go lefty, Righty is Juleson, the former Montreal Canadian, drops back into the lineup to face his old squad. And, you know, I think the debate will begin now, Matt. You know, like if they look good this evening mm -hmm. with the lefty righty, yeah. with Juleson having as good a season as he's had, are they any worse off? Is this mm. any worse a top six? And this is not a, this is not a critique of Ian Cole. He's had a, a good season. Mm -hmm. I think it started a lot better than it's ending, but it's just a good season. He's a solid 35-year-old National Hockey League defenseman. And given how long the season is, first of all, that adds some credibility to the healthy scratch here, or mostly healthy scratch. And it adds some question marks about, you know, like how how much left does he have in the tank come playoff time? Well, here? yeah. So that's an interesting point. I hadn't really considered that. I just assumed, you know, Cole being a leader on the team, a voice on the team would be one of the six come playoff time, but that's an interesting shout. The, the other thing that, the other thing that um, runs against it, Cole averages 1849 time on ice. That's a significant step up from Carson Soucy, who's, 1736. So it's a, a full minute and 23 seconds more than Susie. Zadorov is 1701 as a Canuck. So it's a full minute 48 more than Zadorov. And then Juleson's down there at 1449. So it's four minutes exactly more. Now, a lot of that was early in the season. Understand it. I understand that. And I don't know that Juleson's ice time changes. I think it, what you're doing is you're asking, a net, and for a defenseman, the difference between Susie and Cole, it's one shift. Like a buck 20, that's a shift. Um, so it's two shifts. Well, for a defenseman, it's well, usually over you may a get caught, yeah. Um, so it's one extra shift for Susie. You'd think he could handle that. Um, maybe one extra for Zador, one and a half extra for Zadorov. When, you, when it's broken down like that, you kind of think they can probably do that. Mm -hmm. You know, they can probably fill that void um and, and I, again it's not like i'm settled on this that this is a better top six i just don't know that there's much to to uh to mm -hmm. uh, debate here about which is better and it depends on who you're facing a, a team that plays a little more loose a little more wide open like the montreal canadians hey a, a first pass from noel Juleson is 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 pretty handy if you're facing a more physical more grindy kind of team maybe Ian Cole is a little bit more uh, useful to you. So again, just something to monitor here as we debate the length of this season, what's left for Rick Tockett to do stuff like this. Well, you know, stuff to, to, to figure out what he's going to lean on mm -hmm. in the playoffs. Um, just fleshing this out a little further. So they list Cole at 225. They list Juleson at 201. Juleson's a little taller, so you're giving away a, a little something. And it's how they use it, too. So he's smaller, and he doesn't half. use his physicality as much as Ian Cole does. So maybe that works against it as well. But you say um, things left to do for Rick Tockett and the coaching staff. Well, certainly getting the power play well again, Yeah, I think, is on the checklist. Finding the best set of wingers for Elias Pettersson, I think, is on that checklist trying Elias Lindholm one more time on the wing with Elias. So you have that ability in the playoffs, or at least you have a little bit more familiarity 
with those two? I mean, that may be a Hail Mary at this point, Blake. I know you're big on it, but we'll see if they're going to go that route at all. Of course, finding out, are you just going to reunite the fantastic third line with Bluger, Garland, and Joshua when Dakota comes back from his injury, or are you going to mess with that? I think that's on the checklist as well. Mm -hmm. And although I think we have... I think we have our indication that it's going to be Ian Cole. If you are going with quote unquote, the best six and the four lefties, two righties, which one of those lefties is going to flip over and play the right side in the playoffs. I think it's going to be Ian Cole. If I had to guess, yeah. he's tried to door off there a little bit, tried Susie there a little bit, but I think Cole is the guy amongst the lefties. It could be, could very well be. Uh, there's still the possibility of some extension um, you know, for these defensemen to be tested in other situations. So we'll see, we'll see exactly what Rick Tuckett has in mind. Mm -hmm. Against, as mentioned, uh, tonight, the final Eastern Conference opponent of the season in the Montreal. Who Canadians? Who if, I, I just saw a couple of different data dumps on the Montreal Canadiens here. Um, and listen to uh, easiest team to gain the uh, zone the, by all accounts it's green light everywhere against the Montreal Canadiens but you know as we talked with our pond yesterday our pond basu with it, the athletic if you missed yesterday's show get a good preview there from the Montreal reporter for the athletic mm -hmm. they just seem to step up against good teams like they kept the yeah. high flying oilers to two goals through regulation time like it seems like you should be salivating if you're a Canucks fan. Oh, this is going to be first half Canucks, first half of the season. The stats suggest that, but the Montreal Canadiens seem to res reserve their very best for the best teams. They played Boston tough. They played uh, the Canucks tough, the Leafs, you know, I'm uh, sorry, the uh, Oilers tough. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see which version of the Montreal Canadiens shows up here tonight. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, and uh, I'm also going to be interested in how many Habs fans are in the building because in years past, with the Canucks being awful, this has been a very easy ticket for the Habs fan to get, whereas this year, really from the jump, after winning those two those two fantastic games earlier in the season against Edmonton, that's when the ticket demand started to change, right? And it has only gotten, it has only gotten more pronounced as the season has gone along, and the Vancouver Canucks have been very, a very entertaining Hockey club. Now we'll also see if this continued transformation into more of a defensive oriented team, ironically, more shots, fewer goals, better overall team defense, fewer goals allowed. And the other thing you're monitoring here now is Casey DeSmith, because you're now getting into a realm with Casey DeSmith that he hasn't had a lot of in his national hockey league career. He has been mostly a backup. In Pittsburgh, of course, he may have an axe to grind tonight because he was traded to the Montreal Canadiens in the offseason who immediately said, we have no use for this guy. We intend to trade him. And that's how he got to here in exchange for Tanner Pearson. Although I'm sure he's thankful in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, I think, <laughs> oh, I mean, I every single time that guy's been interviewed this year, even on the nights that he's lost, he's been happy with his lot in life i think he i think he feels uh very very fortunate to have gotten the trade back to some people he knows jim rutherford patrick alvin rick talking from his days in pittsburgh but uh as mentioned you're now getting into a realm with casey DeSmith, and it is DeSmith smith tonight do we have confirmation it is to smith tonight, yeah okay uh you're now getting into a realm uh with DeSmith smith that he's not particularly accustomed to and that is playing all these consecutive games as the starting goaltender was it you or was it jeff who was mentioning there were a couple of uh leaky goals mm, I don't, not me I, I don't i don't think i've i mean he's he's uh he's not stealing the connects in the games he's just playing very well and solid and giving them chances to win and that's ultimately what you ask of your backup goaltender and, mm -hmm. and a guy that's in this situation he's done that so now's the time to try to get a little bit of traction though. We talked about the schedule getting a little bit more difficult next week alone with LA and Dallas. 
these next two games are pretty big. You've got to take care of Montreal and Calgary here and, and so this is lost a, some points back. Yeah, this is a fourth consecutive start for Casey DeSmith and, of course, played more than half of that game against Winnipeg that Thatcher Demko had to leave. So this would be four consecutive starts, about four and a half consecutive games for Casey DeSmith. And, you know, when we looked at spots where you might play Arthur Shilovs, this looked like one of them if you were going to play Archer Shilovs. Uh, as mentioned, we're entirely Western Conference games. The other spot would be the final game of this nine-game homestand, the Sunday matinee at 12.30 start on the 31st against the I Anaheim still say Dallas. L.A. because I, especially if you sweep this week. If you get all three wins this week, L.A. is not going to pelt you with offense. L.A. is not going to overwhelm you. Um, they play a, a boring, slow-paced game that I think she loves to be able to keep pace with. I'm okay with L.A., particularly if they sweep this week. But uh, I think that would be pretty integral because if they drop one or two here in the next two, then that becomes a more desperate game versus the Kings. Mm -hmm. And the Kings, six nothing winners over the Minnesota Wild. I know you had been talking a little yeah, bit about not good for the Minnesota. Wild. Can Minnesota make a, le a late run here and get into that final wild card position, in which case may well play the Vancouver Canucks in round one? Boy, they got shellacked last night. I'm not sure. I actually put it on. Like I was planning on watching it, and then I watched it a few minutes. Pretty of it. soon, yeah. I was like, nope, not interested. Well, I saw them run Marc-Andre Fleury. And I am beginning to wonder whether we're looking at the last few games here yeah. for Marc-Andre Fleury, who is a Hall of Famer, right? He's going to go to the Hall of Fame. He's had a splendid career as the first overall pick and a cup winner in Pittsburgh. Of course, backstop Vegas on that magical run to the Stanley Cup final in their expansion year. I say magical with... <clears throat> Asterix. Son. Speaking of magical run, if, um, if you're scoreboard watching Oilers and Sabres tonight, by the way. Oilers. Yes, Buffalo mm -hmm. making its trip through uh, Western Canada here. Uh, and in Alberta, Calgary Flames announced that Dan Vladar, goaltender, is done for the season. He needs hip surgery. He's expected to be ready for the start of next season. That means their top prospect, or good prospect, Dustin Wolf, gets recalled to service the second goaltender alongside her old friend, Jacob Markstrom. But as Ben Lipka of the Abbotsford News notes, that's a really good development for the Abbotsford Canucks. Why? Well, the Calgary Wranglers are one point ahead of Abbotsford mm. for sixth place in the Pacific Division of the American Hockey League. Now, seven teams do make the playoffs, but as we chronicled a couple of days ago, it's very tightly bunched there in that division. A lot of different teams have the opportunity here to make the playoffs or, in some cases, fall just short. So good news for Abbotsford that they don't have to see Dustin Wolf anymore, who's amongst the best goaltenders in the American Hockey League, one of the better goaltending prospects out there. And of course, the other thing this does, if in fact the timeline is correct for Vladar, it means that the Calgary Flames can once again explore trades for Jacob Markstrom. And I would have to think that they're going to um, find interested parties, find teams that Jacob Markstrom is willing to go to, and I suspect have an ownership group that is a little more willing to move on from a frontline player after missing the Stanley the Cup. The quote playoffs. from Markstrom, we've got to look forward now. Everyone in this room is going to be here now. I've got a contract for two more years, and I'm just excited to be back playing. Coming back from injury, of course, so he slots into the active roster his mm -hmm. first day back on the ice, and Vladar heads to the uh, surgical uh, table. He's been waiting for the moment to do this. They say he's needed the surgery for some time, so it was an mm. opportunistic thing for the Flames to just get that done uh, while they have Markstrom on the mend. So, um, yeah, we'll see. That's uh, it's a team in a very bit of flux, and I don't think there's a lot of Canucks fans that uh, are no. sympathetic. No, no, <laughs> shedding no tears. No. Um, also, uh, probably shedding no tears for Sean Couturier in Philadelphia. 
the Flyers captain is going to be a healthy scratch again. Torts is not done making his point. And frankly, there's a part of me that wonders whether Torts is doing this again because of the backlash on the first healthy scratch of Sean Kutzeria. Yeah. He's stubborn like that, don't you know? Wouldn't comment on Couturier when asked, is John Tortorella trying to get himself fired? Is there a world where Flyers management and ownership would pick Torts over their captain, who they just named 30 days ago? Well, they're, they've admitted they're in a rebuild mode of sorts. And and yet they're still fighting for a playoff spot well, in the East. They're, they're on a top spot. three. Like They're in a top three spot right now in their division. So if he gets them to the playoffs with moves like this, I mean, Couture is not playing well. Um, but it's, I mean, they just named him captain. Like, how, how do you how do you have Couture even on the roster next season? If Torts is the coach. Yeah. Or does everyone just get together after this and sing Kumbaya, make up, and it's... Left in the past. Like, no grudges. We're moving on. Rick Talk, it's not exactly scratching Lindholm, is he? You know, like no. You know, there's there's a comparison of sorts. And do you think there's a world where he would? No. No. Talk it gave a bit of an out today, according to Brendan Basher and, and others that were in the scrum, that uh he's a bit banged up too. So talk it gave mm. an off ramp for Lindholm's play, saying that he's a little bit banged up. Um, we'll see. The good news is for the Flyers is Couturier is only signed for six more years. Oh my. Is it that long? At 7.75. With a full no move? Full no move. Other than that, though, they're okay with it. Yeah. You see, and and that's why it's 31. To, that's He's why 31 with six more years left. Yeah. And, and that's why I think the best organizations, particularly in a cap world, particularly in a cap world, um, work in concert, the coaching staff and upper management with regards to who plays, who doesn't play, what are your aims, what are your goals? Because this is a good way to put yourself in a situation, if you're the Flyers, where you have not a whole lot of leverage trying to move out a pretty good player mm -hmm. who's on a difficult deal to swallow to begin with and then has the final say on the matter, able to reject trades that you might be able to forge with other parties. It creates a small pool. It gives the player all sorts of power. Yep. A and I'm not sure guys like John Tortorella actually think it through to that degree. He is such a laser focused in the moment, win that day, win that game, have a good practice type of coach. I, I, I think that's one of the fair criticisms of him is he hasn't necessarily been a big picture. coach. You remember here in Vancouver, having the Sedins kill penalties and block shots. Now, I just didn't ever think that that it, could it help win a game? Yeah, very possibly could have. Danny and Hank were smart players. Didn't necessarily think penalty killing was their forte, but smart enough to play there. Blocking shots for those two was going to hurt their offensive capabilities. Mm -hmm. That was not for me in the best long term interest of the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, one of a kind. His approach is one of a kind. And I don't know that any Philadelphia Flyers will mourn. No. If he's and, departing. You know, he puts a smile on his, on my face. And you and I both said, hey, we like the league better when Torts is in it. Just don't have him the coach it, of your it, team. Yeah. No, exactly. Let him be somebody else. It's coach. just every once in a while, these situations flare up with him where he is just so clearly in the wrong. And everybody knows the emperor's on stage with no clothes. Every time he's been fired since the Canuck firing, I've said that yes. he has no way he's coming back to the I league. know. I know. He is most charming in interviews as the Aquilini family. He must be. Can attest. Because here's the thing. You've proved your point to us with the one scratch. You know, you've proved your point. Yeah. 
the player's attention has been got. Doing it a second time it just seems like over. I said this a ton of times about kind of coaches and their choice of scratching. And we talked about this with Kuzmenko and others is after you've done an initial scratch at that point, you just got to coach the guy. That's it. And if he can't coach the guy, then you have to have a much more frank conversation with management right. about what's next because you are paid to coach. Right. Coach. No, the that's guy. it. I've said it many times on this show. I will defend a coach's right to healthy scratch just about anybody once. Once you get past that first message send scratch, now you've got some bigger questions in terms of who gives us the best chance to win. See, I, I because y- you can play, you can say I'm about discipline and I'm treating everybody the same and all of that. But at some point, that's a nose despite your face proposition. See, I'll, I'll say that a, a healthy scratch or a scratch, a benching in period, far worse than a healthy scratch. A healthy scratch, you get told about it. You're a little bit mad, but you get to wear your suit, eat popcorn in the press box. There's really, it's just a hurt to the to the pride. You try sitting on the bench, never going over the boards in a period. I've had this talk with Dave Thomason before. He had, a, he had a couple of periods in his career where he sat in the middle and was the book stop while everybody else is playing. Everybody else is going to the boards. You're not. You're sitting there. Mm. To me, that sends a far bigger message than being clean, showered, have, and in a suit up top. We should ask Corrado about that when we have him on next week. Which one is worse? And, of course, you mentioned benching. Like, just sit there and don't play. The Canucks have one of the all-timers. The full game benching. Was it Philip Larson? Who was it? One of the Phillips, wasn't it? Or no, was it uh one of the Phillips? No, it was uh it wasn't it, it was the wingers. It, Rodine. Was it Rodine? Rodine. Anton Rodine. Yeah. Full dressed for the game. Dressed for the game. Did not require a shower. No. <laughs> Did he get the one shift? Nope. No, didn't play it at nope. all. Not a not a single shift. No. Brutal. Of course, it also brings to mind that great Bobby Knight clip. You know, butt hits bench, butt transmits signal up spinal cord to brain. (laughs) Brain says, got to play better. It's a hell of a process that goes on there. (laughs) Anyways, so yes, expecting that Ian Cole is not going to play tonight and that Noah Jilson will Canucks in the fifth game of this nine-game home stand before hosting the rival Calgary Flames on Saturday. A couple of Canadian teams here back-to-back at Rogers Arena in the midst of this marathon homestand. All right, let's get to today's menu. It is brought to you by Greta. Fantastic. Oh, no, it's brought to you by Ben Moss Jewelers. My apologies. We're Thursday here today, right? Yes, by Ben Mm -hmm. Moss Jewelers. Put me on ease and O's. Grady. Ben Moss Jewelers, proudly Canadian-owned and operated, history dating back more than 100 years, five locations in B.C., including Willowbrook and Langley, Coquitlam Center, committed to customer satisfaction. You can check out the large selection of Canadian mine diamonds, lab-grown diamonds, mine diamonds available on a payment plan to suit your needs. For more info, check out benmoss.com. Ben Moss, shine bright. We'll talk to Patrick Johnson. We'll ask him about length of season. We'll ask him about uh, Elias Pettersson will ask him about black skate. Are we headed to a world where black skate is the jersey of choice? Matt, I'll tell you this. In the Stanley I Cup I watched that game the other day. At home at Rogers Arena. I watched that game the other day. It didn't even register that they were wearing the skate. Like That's, that's how, how ubiquitous it has now become. Yeah. Because the other thing, too, and we saw a lot of this when we were at Park Casino, uh, a week ago yesterday in advance of the game against Colorado. You see more black skate jerseys on the street and around the rink, at least I do, than the blue jerseys. People love it. And if the players are playing well on it, if it, it I think it's at this point, it is giving that swagger that we talked about. And, and the other, uh, I get so many messages from people out of market who just know we cover the Canucks when they wear the black skates commenting oh, yeah. on how beautiful they are. Yeah. I don't remember the black skate being so universally beloved 
outside of British Columbia when they wore them back in the day. No, no, but they're certainly onto something here. Retro vintage. And remember, if they go down two nothing in the series, you can't just say, oh, now they should wear this. Kit. No, you got to make the call. Got to make the call. NC Hammer on YouTube. God know the skate jerseys puke emoji. Really? You're in the minority, Mr. Really? Hammer. Yeah. I thought that was legitimately MC Hammer. NC Hammer. Oh. Yeah. Must be from North Carolina. Or there is his initials. One of the two. Black skate jersey. Not a fan. Not a fan. Puke emoji. Won't touch it. No. Uh, yeah. Hashtags, best and worst of Twitter. You terrible. caught it there, right? Huh? You caught it? Terrible. It was terrible. I apologize. Uh, we'll get to some hashtags, the best and worst of Twitter. The reigning, defending gold medalists in Olympic soccer have their route to a second consecutive gold medal in Paris this summer. We'll tell you who our ladies are going to play at the Olympics as reigning Olympic champions we'll get into that we'll also get into uh some seattle seahawks news coming down and mike d'agostino interim head coach vancouver whitecaps fc a vancouver guy who has risen to be vanny sartini's lead assistant and when vanny got suspended for the first six matches of this season later reduced to four mike d'agostino got the big whistle he, he gets to make the in-game strategy calls. And he's had the Midas touch this year. Couple of substitutes score in San Jose to get a road victory. Caps took eight games to get a road victory last year. Got one in their first match away from BC Place this year. Then turned around the next week and shellacked Dallas to forge this record of two wins and one draw after three MLS matches. And a really interesting comment from D'Agostino with regards to this specific player group being a different group when it comes to maturity and confidence when playing away from BC Place. Now, they won't have to worry about that for a while because they're playing effectively a nine-game homestand. Yeah, the, <laughs> they're the playing the, bank, the soccer equivalent of what the Canucks are on starting this Saturday at 4.30 against Real Salt Lake an opportunity to go three wins in four, which may well just get them atop the Western Conference. We'll see. They're in second place right now. By the way, selfish play-by-play -play guys speaking, but I love the 4.30 starts. Love the 4.30 starts. Love it. I, I, I say this to the Lions and the Caps at every opportunity. Give me those afternoon weekends when the weather turns nice. Love them. Open roof. That is my ideal time for either football or soccer at BC Place when the sun's out, when the weather is good. Well, that's if I thing. don't need to bundle up, I want to be outside taking in the proceedings. But now that the BC clocks Place have changed on the too. weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Now that the clocks have changed, you go to the Whitecaps game, you'll be out. The sun will still be up. It will be bright out still. And you, and you feel like you right. should. But it's also out of the way, tucked away late enough in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You can still go do something no, in the day. I, I love what Amar Doman said. You know, like it, those 430 starts, it gives you the ability to do something before the game yeah. and after the game. And in fact, on Saturday, Really fun triple header, if you're so willing. Oh, this is great. You can watch the Canadian men in a big one against Trinidad and Tobago. Win gets them into the Copa America. And, of course, this is a Canadian men's national soccer team that has some making up to do after what was a and again really poor showing following the World Cup. They would be in Argentina's group for the Copa America. With Messi. So fun. Then you can watch the Caps then that spills right over into the Canucks. In fact, I'm sure there will be some of you that are going the to the Caps dip. and the Canucks game on Saturday. There might be a basketball tournament on TV too, if you're so inclined. It's a great time of year for sports. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Coming up to the Masters as well, yeah. golf, playoff, basketball, playoff hockey. It's going to be a blast. Uh, Patrick Johnson is coming up next. In a season like this, you never want to miss a single second 
of what's happening on the ice, and you want to be around your fellow fans, right? Well, Greta Bar YVR at 50 West Cordova, the perfect spot to do so. Hey, if you've got tickets, a great place to pre and post. They've got drink specials every single day. And if you don't have tickets, well, stick around and soak up the atmosphere with all your fellow fans, play all the great video games and air hockey, great air hockey setup as well at Greta Bar YVR. We'll see you there, 50 West Cordova. Joined now by Canucks beat writer for the province and post media, Mr. Patrick Johnston. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Start with our Tim Hortons poll question. The NHL regular season. Is it too long? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's sort of, it, it, it is absolutely the dog days right now. Yes. Right? Yeah. Can we just yeah. fast forward to the playoffs? Because yeah. I mean, here's yeah. Here's, we covered bad teams, and this part of the year was the death march. Yeah, and now we're covering a really good team, and I still feel like uh, let's just fast forward to the let's play. Just end it. And, yeah. and let's think about six is almost the perfect yeah. sweet spot. Yeah, and then let's think about it. Right, you've got kind of three or four teams in each conference that are still chasing that seven eight spot. Right, you take those four teams and you have a little playing tournament. Everybody else gets a week off or whatever, and we start the playoffs next week with some excitement. There's some build in. Everybody's pumped. Let's go. Follow-up question. Is March break too long? No, it's perfect. I mean, I don't know. As a no. teacher, it was perfect. Yeah, I'm as sure parent, it was. As a parent, I, I'm I, whatever. No, the kids are happy. That's all. Yeah, exactly. I kids have, are burnt out. I have, I, you know, listen, I feel terrible for the people who don't have access to child care. I do. I'm in a strong position. I hope everybody is able to get access to child care. But that could be another podcast. I go downstairs to the garbage yesterday. My neighbor's there. There are four young children running around the property screaming. One has left their jacket in the front yard. It's blown around. The other has left their uh, backpack in the backyard. And my neighbor looks at me and goes, Matt, March break. They get two weeks now. Ain't it great? Through gritted teeth. Now, to be clear, I will. How did they know, finagle a second week? How did they fin- do? You really, Matthew? Do you really want to know? Yes. Well, here's why. Fifteen years ago, the BC Liberals decided they wanted to cut the fucking budget, and so the easiest way to do was to make all each day a little bit longer, and mm-hmm. then you can save on a second week. And you don't. I'm not making this up. You mm-hmm. don't pay for heating, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff right. that you save money on, and that's you've told us this in the past. Actually, I, I grew up in a period of uh, a period of time in Ontario, Blake. Perhaps you were in Toronto at the time as well. Ray days, Bob Ray was the premier, federal uh, cabinet Same minister thinking. for the Liberals, but NDP yeah. premier, and uh, the budget shortfall. So they just decided to give us a whole bunch of Fridays off during the course of the school. Yep. I think that was, it was the damnedest thing. That was the start of. Professional days, I believe. I don't think no, I no, I think there were professional days before that, but we certainly got all these bonus days that we were just off, and parents were furious. Yeah. So this is one of those ones. Like teachers weren't gonna like they could like it. What they had to serve. It's not us. Like Mm -hmm. for once, it wasn't them. (laughs) You guys wanted to work. Eventually, the kids do get older. You see, though, guys, and then. You don't see them for the two weeks. They just that's right. They just FO and do whatever the hell they want. That's and right. It impacts you in no way whatsoever. So uh it's all right. They're happy. Anyway. So you're yeah. you're a play in tournament guy. You'd like yeah. to see that in the league? Yeah, I am in general. I think I think um I, I think the 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 buzz it creates, there's fundamentally not a lot of difference between a team that's seventh and a team that's eight tenth in terms of quality. It builds a buzz. And I think the other way you should do it is that there's there you need to find ways to give incentives to finishing at the top, right? And so like rest, right? That's a big one. Give them give those make those teams a little more tired. Now, obviously, I do talk a lot about player welfare, but yeah, like give rest as a as a, an advantage, at least in that regard for a team for finishing high. I, I like that because what we're seeing right yeah. now with the Golden Knights sinking and now the Wild again losing last night as they did, uh, didn't uh, preserve much drama. But, uh, you know, there's no consequence right now, it appears, for the Vegas Golden Knights sinking. Well, if the Golden Knights knew that by sinking at this point that they would have to play in a play-in tournament, um, maybe they would have been a little bit more reticent to uh, – 
flirt with LTIR uh, loopholes and, uh, and and try to put pedal to the metal to make sure they're in the top six. In the end, I'm more about the advantage of finishing higher. Like, I think, yeah, yeah that's exactly it. You want to create an incentive to go for six as yeah. opposed to, you know, I mean, I'm not I, punishing teams. I think just create an incentive to go for six. I mean, look, I, re- I wrote this, I think this, I wrote this very early in the pandemic because I was stuck for ideas. But, you know, I looked at like the incentives of relegation battles, right? Like the way teams, you will find teams that are actually are trying to fight to finish 17th in the Premier League, you know, so they don't go down. Right. Like there are there are reasons to want to win at the end of the season. I think the gold plan has some merits, but I think creating a play in situation is better. But well, Vegas risks missing altogether now. Yes. Wow. Play in tournament, they have some they got, they got they got some they've got some help here. The blues and the wild have most yeah. recently lost. So so are are you for the NBA format then? Seven plays eight. The winner is in, and then the loser of seven eight plays the winner of nine ten for the final spot. Is that how the NBA one works? Again? Yeah, so I mean, you, yeah. yeah, build a little bracket, or I mean, I would kind of love having a little quick little round robin or something like that. I think that would be fun because then you're chasing goals, right? Like make them mm-hmm. chase goals. Um, yeah, yeah. Any any format that's interesting, I'm in favor of. Gotcha. Garland and Hoaglander. Right. Have they found the recipe for success for Petey? Are those the two best wingers to play with Petey at the moment or long term? At the moment, I think so. Probably. I've always been a bit skeptical of the Gar of putting Garland on a line with Pedersen or Miller. I I think I look at Garland as a guy when he's on the line, he wants the puck on a stick. And Pedersen's a guy that wants the puck on his stick, and Miller's the guy that wants the puck on his stick, and 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 so they are. I, I always think it's a bit of an awkward fit. Um, he's a wing. He's a center from the wing, isn't he? Garland, a little bit, yeah. Like he's yeah. the playmaker on the line, yeah. right? And yeah. that's why he's worked so well with like Bluger and Joshua. Um, and so yeah, when jo- Dakota Joshua comes back, I think you have to put those two back together, no matter who your center is. I think those two absolutely have to go back together. But for the moment, yeah, sure. It it, it seems to be working. He certainly thinks the game at a at a pace and at a level that Pedersen does. Um, Hoaglander's figured it out this year, what his role has to be. And certainly since he's joined Pedersen, has figured out what his role has to be on that line. Um, so, yeah, I think they're a great fit right now. Well, let's galaxy brain this. Uh, what if you keep those two as a pair, but upgrade Bluger into Lindholm does that make that third line even better? Should that third line even be even better with those? I three? mean, yeah, you'd think so. Certainly, you know, the Lindholm obviously story is is that. I mean, look at Saturday night. I'm sure you guys have talked about this, but hey, the puck comes to him, the goalie's out of position, and he still tries to pass it. Like a player who's completely lacking in confidence, I, you put him with Garland and Joshua, and they will put the puck on his stick in front of the net, and he will have no choice but to shoot. And we've seen so, with Mikheyev what one goal can do. Yeah. Like it's not like he's been a landslide of goals from Mikheyev, but no. he's changed. He's been yeah. a different player since yeah. he scored. Yeah. The, the the funny thing was, I talked. I think I talked to him on. We well, scored on Wednesday, right? Talked to my. I talked to him a little bit on Tuesday morning. Just said, "Hey, how's it going? You look like you're. You know, you look like you're feeling." He goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, going good. Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, he sort of does this nodding thing. Oh yeah, yeah. And then and then the next day, Coos talked to him and had a little story on him. And you know, so clearly the post media writers were the ones that sent the right assist to post media. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no, he's looking. We once, back. A, we once had a, a player, a Hart Trophy winner here, who you know would have the puck in the high slot and find a way to pass it in the corner. Different yeah, player, huh? though, sir. Yeah, different player, sir. Yeah, all player. <laughs> um, yeah. You wrote on Lucky Black Skate Jersey. And yeah. I got, I got another message Tuesday. Shout out to our buddy Mike Allen. They have to wear these jerseys in the playoffs. They have to. Right? Yeah. I mean, they have to pick, right? Like, they can't swap around. The mm-hmm. pick one, that's it. League makes you pick. Um, I mean, I think they should. I'm not convinced that they will. You know, obviously, had a brief exchange with with Jim Rutherford, he, pre, you know, he appreciated the stat, um, but sort of joking. What is the it, stat now for those who they've lost? Uh, so 15 times. I, I actually had J pad to give me a late correction because I'd missed that. There was an extra game off the original uh, schedule that they were going to wear the black. So they, they actually have two regulation losses in black and an overtime loss in black. Otherwise 12 wins. 12 and, it's, and, and, and the split 
the goal split, they've scored something like 63% of the goals, which is greater than the split that they've had on the season. You know, that they they play well. I mean, there are there is there have been a lot of psychological research, as I mentioned in my story, into black t- teams that wear black get penalized more. There seems to be some sort of negative connotation with Darth officials. Vader syndrome. Darth Vader yeah. type situation. The villain situation. wears black, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then all these studies that have been done over the years suggesting maybe red teams win more. Well, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of color. If, anyway, the, the point is, is that, that players like it. They feel more aggressive. Who doesn't want more aggressive hockey? And the Canucks have been winning. Anyway, Jim Rutherford chuckles. He says, as if, as if the whole explanation would just be about what we're wearing. But... Uh, he did, you know. I think I, I think they probably won't. I mean, someone I don't know. I, I can't honestly remember who it was. We were debating this question. There was somebody who sort of thinks about marketing, and they said, "But the thing is, is that you you have to do the hypothetical. What do you want to look like hold, hoisting the Stanley Cup?" And the corporate answer would be, "You wear what your bloody logo is that you have." And if you mm-hmm. didn't like your Orca logo, you should have switched in the first place. So. Uh- that's there, the sad, cynical answer. The positive answer is what I wrote the other day, yesterday. Is there another complication? Would they have to fashion a white or gold? I don't think so. No. Skater, you can no. just wear black and then you, you what pick if one at home and you pick one on the road, and that's it. Yeah, that's my. Oh, so you wear white logo or white orca on the road? Yeah. On the road, and you wear black skate at home. Yeah, correct. So, so the league allows that. Yes. Well, he just told me that you have to pick one. Yeah, you, you, no, no, sorry. You have to pick. You have to pick. To be clear, you have to pick. You, you. When I say one, I mean at home. Like at, on the road, you're obviously wearing your whites and your. You only have one. You have. Yeah. You only have. Yeah. So you can't. You can't swap back and forth. Uh, 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 between your third and your. your but could they shirt. fashion a white? No. No. Too late. At this point, no. That's too no. late. Too late. They would have. And also, you're not. As I've. I mean, this. This goes back to. As far as I know, this is still true, but a series of long discussions during the 50th season with Chris Brumwell, basically about how this all played out. Because if you remember, they they did actually wear, if I'm not mistaken, because they, they wore the black skate, like the, the, the original retro black skate, three times, and they were supposed to wear it a fourth time. But that game never happened. I never confirmed which game it was. But um, yeah, you had to get special dispensation from the league to wear a fourth jersey, which you would incorporate into your set of sort of allowed third jersey nights. So you basically didn't wear your third jersey and they would let you wear an alternate, a fourth sweater. But basically they allow teams to have three sweaters and that's it. See, if Mark Cuban was an NHL um, owner, he would just dress them however he wants and be like, what are you going to do? Take it like in the, in the playoffs, what are you going to do? Take the game away from me? Like, uh, yeah. you know, what are they going to do? Big fine. I mean, they, they, like to be clear, they've also done reverse retros and that, but that's a league thing. But in terms of yeah. teams having sort of a, a standard sort of branding look, they are allowed their regular home, a regular road, and then an alternate version of one of those. Generally, they do it at home because they can sell more of them that way. By the way, you just gave me a great idea for the next reverse retro: the skate in red. Yes, absolutely. Huh? Yes. Bring uh, just you want just the salmon. No, not, not I don't want that. I don't want to say I want the red that we see, which is a okay. nice red. Yeah. And then maybe you know, the problem with a lot of this stuff is that you then you get players need to wear new gloves and all that sort of thing. Maybe it fade into black so that you've got black at the at the gloves still, but I don't yeah. know. Red would be cool. Yeah. I'm with you. You know me, I'm a style guy, Matt. Matt's yeah, really, really impressed. What a fashion guy. He's not a uh, he's not a jersey guy. Matt. No, no, probably not as much as the next person. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, I'm about the team representing the city and community more so than the fashion and what it looks like. We were talking about like X's and O's. Who Garland works with? How did we get to like red jerseys? Well, because so he wrote on it. We move. How we move quick? So we, we <laughs> Matt did that this discussion. I did this. <laughs> it was not particularly pithy. It lasted less than six minutes by my calculations. <laughs> we moved on to what he had written about. In the province this week. Yeah, let me ask you this about the way the Canucks have played of late. They, they we spent seven good minutes on jerseys, and now we're moving on to our third subset. They've had periods of dominance in the shot clock here of late, not yeah. on, the, on, the, on the scoreboard at all. And yeah. yet I would argue this is not regression from the first half of the season. And, and that they're actually they're kind of outshooting that first half of the season. Remember in the first half of the season, they didn't outshoot 
teams yeah. a ton if they did at all because they yeah. had four nothing leads early and then surfed on on score effects until the end of the game yeah. so um you know what's what's happening here how do you how do we describe right. increased defense increased shots and less offense it's it's kind of weird yeah, it's the sort of loosey goosey of the early in the season. I mean, just look at the Canucks themselves, how their yeah. defense has progressed, right? Yeah. Like you start the season and you're working on improving things as the season goes along. So, yeah, some of that was that. Some of it was that every shot was going in. I did have someone pretty smart who sort of said, well, you know, some of the story here may be that, like, in a way, because they're scoring so quickly, they're missing out on all these extra shots. Um, yeah, which, I know, agree. There's sort of something, it's hard to prove, but there's sort of something to that. Um, and I think, yeah, you're right. Like the finishing is not as what is not there as it was at the beginning. Um, and, and you know, a lot of it too is just the power edge on the power play, right? Like, like the fact the power play has struggled as much as it had shot volumes down. What I mean, the last I checked was last week, but shot volume was down as of last week was down 20% on the season from since since the all-star break, right? Like they, they said they were for the Canucks. For the Canucks, yeah. like on the power play, like their power, power play, you know, and I like, like, yeah, like, and it's, it's talk it the way, it, and it's not just simply the, what the fans shoot, scream shoot, right? Like you still have to create your, your looks and it kind of doubled back on that. And then talk, I talked a little bit about that the other day was that, you know, we're not that, that he did not think the power play still was doing enough to create enough good looks that they were getting there. But that you know you have to get the looks and get the shots off, and uh, you know that's been a struggle. I mean, you look at the loss to Washington; they missed the net. What was it? They between block shots and missed shots, they 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 misfired forty eight times. They had twenty one shots on goal and forty eight misses. Now, your shot at the reason why we talk about shot attempts now versus shots is because obviously a lot of pucks don't get to the net or miss the net. Um, but but usually you're not missing on a sort of a two to one ratio like they were on Saturday and and double back with Taka's point that we weren't even getting inside like they needed to fight to get position and get inside and get in front of the net and create rebounds and you again to compare with the success at the beginning of the season th this ability to tip pucks Brock Besser obviously scoring a tip goal the, last week um, which you know was a reminder of what they've done so well. And you know, Hoaglander, I think, is tied for fifth in the league in tip shots. Like they they've had a lot of success getting inside. And you know, when they lose, not surprisingly, it's probably often because they aren't getting in there. So the defenses are better, they the teams understand what the Canucks are trying to do better. Um, you you were never going to continue scoring at the you know, the finish or sorry, finishing at the rate that they were finishing at. Um, it's a whole bunch of things, but in mm -hmm. the end, to me, as I noted the other day. You know, the, the five on five, you can keep battling at and probably fix because you've had so much success this year. The things that worry me are the power play. You know, you got to get back and track and the penalty kill. Like they've they've cut down on their penalties, but but the PK's success rate has dipped and you need it to be more than 20th in the league if you're going to have any success in the playoffs. With what we saw Lindholm do in his first game, like they've got the best net front tipping group in the yeah. league. Possibly, yeah, mm -hmm. and and they have for years. Like I wrote about this earlier in the year, um, the number of of goals that they score on sort of net front. I mean, I think back often to something Troy Stetcher said when he was still here, and this is like six seven years ago, was talking about the need to get the puck to the net and the way they did it. And this goes back through coaches, right? It's not just it's not just Rick Tockett, but it's something about the skill set of players that they've accumulated over the years that sort of reinforce itself on and on. And then it's not slap shots. It's getting pucks through that can be tipped. And the, the Canucks have had a lot of good players at it. Besser and Hoaglander right now, Horvat and Kuzmenko last year, uh, Horvat going back seasons. Like it, it's been something they've been good at. It actually turned out in, hilariously at one, when I wrote my story, a guy we never thought of, but it turned out he was actually pretty good at it. And I actually talked to him about it and he was kind of blown away was Brandon Sutter. Uh, Brandon Sutter was a good guy in front of the net mm. getting rebounds. He had a lot of rebound goals, and he immediately recognized what that meant. He goes, oh, man, that's a man picking up garbage. So, yeah. anyway, they've been good at it. Blake's point is a good one, though, the, the premise of his last question, and that is, are, are we seeing a transformation of the club that is going to be permanent mm. in terms of being a more defensive-minded, defensive-oriented, win-lower scoring mm games because those shots on goal have been low all season yeah. 
long, you finally got your best six defensemen healthy. You don't even have your number one goalie right now. Yeah. Patrick, think of like yeah. if you get yeah. an extra save or two during this well, stretch. I think, I think they win what last the, game what three the one score line. Yeah. What the score yeah. lines look like. And and more most importantly, I guess, is that a good thing? Is that a better recipe or formula than what they were doing earlier in the season? Just barraging teams with goals and you know converting at such a high percentage. Well, they were, you know, I mean, they were they were better defensively off the bat anyway. But yes, they are improved defensively versus the beginning of the season. And yeah, I think you would argue that if you are taking care of your own end and you're only giving up two goals a game, you do have a better chance of winning in the long run. Um, especially when you believe in the scoring talent you have and, and you have guys scoring in the way they've been able to score. And that comes back to the power play issue, which is if you can if you can lull them to death five on five and then you have a lethal power play well you're going to go a long way so that that absolutely is the formula that rick talk has been trying to instill all season um and they have elements have have shown elements of it in the last few weeks obviously there was uh disappointment on saturday against washington bad finish against colorado but go back to the week before and those wins over vegas and la and 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 winnipeg were all about exactly that not giving anything away at the back being ready to counter punch when you had your chance and, and finishing and um that that very much is what they want to be going forward and hey, that's what rick talkett wasn't at in arizona right like his team was a very efficient team and i said this way back at the beginning of the season he just didn't have any talent you know phil kessel yeah. was his best forward on that team connor garland was a very good player on that team but he was a young guy and Garland, as I I know I've said here before, if Garland, I asked him about that team. He said, this team has just way more talent than that one did. You know, Rick's, Rick's a very disciplined, very focused in coach, wants, you know, has high expectations for us, and we need to deliver on those. And now this team can actually score, unlike the team in Arizona. Mm. Lastly, do you agree with why it aren't? Do the Canucks have to do some sort of French fry promotion? <laughs> lean, <laughs> lean into Frygate. <laughs> yeah. The yes. only way to neuter it, right? Sterilize it. Make All it you need, yeah. Make it your own. Yeah, you I mean, actually do something for the fans. If they score three goals, everybody gets fries. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's a low bar. And you know what? The, if the players like, that's one of those ones. I mean, I go way back. This is twenty-one years ago. My buddy Mike McGurr, who was the uh, Northwest League Pitcher of the Month for the Vancouver Canadians, July two thousand four. Mike, uh, Mike would tell you. Mike would tell you that uh, just, that just, back in those days when they had the uh, the Dutch, uh, you know, inning right. promotion, and if the pitcher struck out the side, everybody won a bucket of the Dutch. Like Mike had that happen a couple times, and he was not a fireballer, but sometimes he would actually be able to get the guys to strike out. And he told me that he would get fired up too. So you know, <laughs> hey, surely we've seen the players. Deep. Knowing that they're chasing fries for the fans would get fired up. We've NBA. seen it with pizza, right? Yeah. Like break a hundred points, get pizza, yeah. score five goals, and get pizza. Go. The fans, it it absolutely engages the, the, the fans. fans chance. So. Oh yeah, it's good I'm stuff. with you. And uh, boy, that was July 2004 for Mike Pitcher. So month. yeah, Mike comes in 2003 and makes every start. The only pitcher for the Canadians that year to make every start. A's really liked wow. him, but uh, yeah. basically through through way too much. They sent him to instructional league. He can't do anything. They're like, all right, take a rest over the winter. Comes back to spring training. Of course, he's way behind on his throwing program because they told him to rest. They're like, what happened? He goes, you told me to rest. They basically, at this point, he realized, man, this is never going to happen. This mm. is how it goes. I'm just a guy. Mm. Anyway, they, they tell him he's going to be a reliever. He breaks the season with King County. Ta doesn't know how to be a reliever. They Short season, and the Northwest League comes back, comes back. And, of course, that no, that era, it was all guys out of college hitting with wood, wood bats for the first time. So Mike just had a summer where he just mm -hmm. toyed with these guys and had, you know, he gave up like one run in all of July. It was something dumb like that. Mabel Durham. Maple Durham. Mm. It's a movie. We make it about your friends. There you go. <clears throat> no, but he, well, no, it works because he's from Boston. Well, I've just, July 2004 goes down with 408 goals for Ferraro. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you've been reminded of that. It, oh, no. It's, it's, one of my, best it's one of my worst favorite facts. Like, it's just oh, okay. so silly. Boy, it rolled off the brain and tongue pretty yeah, quickly that was, there. That was good. Yeah. Well, it was the thing, like I said, the 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 the, the, the pancakes. Like he was just so pumped about the dough. What Best month is it? Well, didn't you give us the month there? July, July, July two thousand four. Uh, Northwest uh, League, July, <laughs> Northwest League pitcher of the month. I mean, that's not the opening line of a cover letter. Yeah, I don't know exactly, what it is. Yeah. 
Uh, give our best to Mike. <laughs> I Thank will. you for this, Patrick. <laughs> Take care. See you. <laughs> Vancouver Canadians baseball. Get your tickets. Canadians baseball. Dot com. Hey, everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.